All right, have OpenAI just fumbled the launch of GPT-5? I mean, have you seen these graphs? I mean, look at it, what is going on? This is crazy. Really, are we supposed to believe that 52.8 is bigger than 69.1, which is the same size as 30.8? I mean, what is the point of this bar chart? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I don't understand how they're able to get away with this. And let's remember that this is a private company that's seeking like over 500 billion in valuation, despite being unprofitable and producing graphs, which could be made by someone who's in primary school. I was personally really excited for this launch because I pay for ChatGPT and use it basically every day for work. But after watching their launch release, I'm starting to wonder whether they're actually making the improvements that they say they are. But I haven't actually like been upfront of what I actually do. So I'm actually a uh, PhD maths researcher. So I work um, on maths on a day-to-day -day basis. I have been quite excited and this sounds quite sad uh, for the release of um, GPT-5 because maybe it will have new capabilities in trying to solve um, some research problems that I've been working on. So this is actually a paper that I've been writing, you know, you can see here. It's got lots of equations, not super important uh, what they are, but I'm just quite excited to see whether the new model will be able to tackle some of the problems that the previous ones weren't able to do. So to start, I asked a fairly simple prompt. I basically wanted a visual interactive kind of page like in HTML so that I could explain to you guys some aspect of the research that I'm doing. So I was just trying to simulate what's called the Riemann zeta function. Perhaps you've heard of it before from the a million dollar Clay Institute problem called the Riemann hypothesis. It's a function in the sense that when you give it a number, it gives you another number back. And the first thing I asked GPT-5 to do was to make a simulation that basically showed this. So on the left, you have the number that you put in. Um, it's a special two-dimensional number called a complex number and on the right it shows you the number that you get out so as you wiggle around on the left you'll move the point on the right and I've got to say this kind of blew me away to be honest it did take a few prompts but this is a good 500 lines of code which would have taken me so long that I never would have actually gone through to do it the main reason being is that it's just a simulation to explain what the Riemann zeta function is and how it looks and it's not really related to my actual job doing research in this area I'd used O3 before to make simulations like this, in particular for outreach talks. For example, here's one that shows this thing called a Koch curve, which has infinite length. And when you join them together, you can get this weird Koch snowflake, which has infinite perimeter, but obviously it's enclosed in a finite area. So it has finite area. The quality of this new simulation on GPT-5 in thinking mode is clearly a cut above the previous simulations I've done. And I've got to say, I'm pretty impressed. And when it comes to actual maths research, I've had multiple times where it gives me very good answers. And sometimes it's actually quite mind blowing to see the level of kind of creativity that it gives for some maths problems. So this isn't a complete rigorous test. To some extent, it's a bit like a vibe test just to see how it feels to use. This prompt took me a good 10 minutes to write up. Up, and I've really tried to give it as much information as possible to try and give me some research direction on the problems that I've been working on. Now I ended up thinking for four minutes which is decent and was actually one of the concerns that I had when watching OpenAI's event yesterday because they've basically given less kind of granularity when you select the particular model that you want to use. I'd previously mostly been using O3 when I had an important problem because I knew that it would actually take time to reason with the question before answering it. The answer that it gave to this problem was genuinely very interesting. It's kind of given some suggestions which I hadn't really thought of before and I'd given this same problem to O3 and it hadn't given such a detailed answer. Plus it's doing it in quite a short amount of thinking time like three minutes to six minutes so hopefully they're managing to get the inference costs down so that it's actually more sustainable of a business model for them because obviously if they're constantly operating at a loss despite these really big valuations it won't be sustainable to give these services to people which would be a shame because they are so incredibly useful. I then asked it a follow-up question and it thought for even longer and it gave an answer which which I then checked, which is correct. And so you might hear a lot of stuff on the internet about ChatGPT not being good at maths or something like this, but at least for me, as a PhD student, I think it's kind of invaluable. Like I know that I could do research without it, that's true, but genuinely having something that I can give so much information to in a short amount of time, like 10 minutes, and it will give me a reasonable answer, which is actually quite logical to the extent where it actually seems like it's understood what I've asked it. And so yeah, sure, it's quite funny that they put these really strange graphs into their presentation, but actually when testing the product, I'm very impressed. I have tried Gemini as well, but to my experience in the area that I do, it's just nowhere near as good as ChatGPT. I actually gave it the same exact prompt as what I've given him, and the answer was terrible. You know, when you're asking it a question, you can normally tell if the answer is reasonable or not, and in this case, the answer that Gemini gave was crap. In every kind of maths question that I've asked, at least, ChatGPT has always given a much more creative and interesting answer 
I don't have a bias here. I don't care if anyone signs up to ChatGPT. I use it because it accelerates the rate at which I can do work so that I can do other stuff uh, like learn the piano and loads of other things that you would see on this channel because this is not the standard video uh, for this channel. So now that I've actually had a chance to try it, I guess I'm starting to have a bit of doubts of what I was reading online of all of the negativity surrounding this model. Sure, the graphs are crazy, but the model does seem to perform really well. And at least from what they've said, they're able to do it much more efficiently than the previous models, which is just a good thing, because it means that this will actually be a sustainable service that they can keep providing so that we can keep having this really useful tool to do research and, you know, for whatever you use it for, because I know so many people use it for so many different things. I have friends in the semiconductor industry that have been blown away by this update. Uh, I've already heard like two of them explaining how exactly this model has been way better. Like one of them was testing it on a bug that they had yesterday with O3, corrected one bug, and then they tried the same prompt today with GPT-5 on thinking mode, obviously, and it's then come up with three more bugs. I know this is just like a first-hand account, but I think it does just go to show how useful these tools are.